And now we turn to the Ukraine where nearly 300 people have been killed, those aboard a Malaysian Airlines flight. Ukrainian government officials say the flight was shot down by a missile. Pro-Russian rebels and Ukrainian military officials taking responsibility for the crash. The fiery moment of impact. A passenger jet with 295 people on board crashing this morning in Ukraine near the Russian border. Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, traveling from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur, was believed to be flying at about 33,000 feet when airline officials say they lost contact with the Boeing 777. At least one U.S. official says analysis now shows that the plane was brought down by a sophisticated missile, although it's unclear where it was fired from and who is responsible. Experts say the pilot likely had no time to react. My guess is this came out of nowhere and there was absolutely no warning. This scene unfolding in the area where tensions between Ukraine, pro-Russian rebels and the Kremlin have been escalating. In the past week, Ukraine claimed Russia shot down two of its military planes, one factor behind President Obama's increased sanctions against Russia announced yesterday. The president today saying the U.S. will help with the crash investigation. And as a country, our thoughts and prayers are with all the families of the passengers, wherever they call home. This, just another nightmare involving Malaysia Airlines, just more than four months after Flight 370 mysteriously disappeared. It's just shock. You get, you get this sick feeling in the pit of your stomach. Families now waiting for information as investigators make their way to the still scene. All right, let's bring in our next guest, Mike Lyons, frequent friend of the program, military analyst for CBS News Radio affiliate CBS stations across the country, also a senior fellow at the Truman National Security Project in D.C., and he's kind enough to join us via Skype. Mike, what a mess here. Um, and give the people at home an idea. There's been so much finger-pointing at the moment. Uh, you have Putin right now who says, don't look to us, we didn't have any involvement. The Ukrainian military says this was at the hands of the rebels right now. We do know one thing at least. One of these surface-to-air missile systems, the book that actually can have reach beyond the 20,000-foot ceiling that is uh, one of the more advanced systems out there, one of those was taken um, from the Ukrainian military. In fact, we saw it on Russian TV that it was in the hands of the rebels. Is that probably uh, the most likely scenario? We, we does believe by all accounts it was shot down from a missile. It's either that, right, or it was shot down from a jet, and we see no evidence to that. As we stand here right now, is that the most plausible scenario? That's what it is. It couldn't have been a man pad. It couldn't have been a surface uh, uh, air mire fired missile from a shoulder fired weapon. Those are more heat seeking than anything else. It had to be uh, a rocket that came from the ground. Um, and that book system, uh, the S-11, uh, the Gadfly, which is NATO refers to it as, does have that capability. Now, this could have been a big ruse. They take this um, weapon system from the Ukraine government and they take possession of it. But it's really impossible to fire that system without a high level of training. Both from a simulation perspective, there's a fire control direction center perspective, there's arming the weapon, there's all kinds of things that go on there. And I, that's what has me concerned right now is the fact that have they been training all along? Did that come in out of Russia? So forensically, that's the kind of analysis that we have to conduct right now. And just so I understand, uh, it seems on the ground at least the rebels have recovered the black box. We haven't gotten confirmation on it, but at least that's what they're saying right now. When there's an investigation like this, and the gold standard apparently is the U.S. NTSB here, but when we try and figure out what actually happened, Mike, um, it, it, we'll be able to tell the experts at least been saying all day what shot it down and where it came from, but we need to have here who pushed the button, right? And that's going to be the hardest part out of this. It is. I think we're going to have to rely on satellite technology uh, that's an area of the world that's heavily uh, radar covered, for example, and, and look to try to understand, shoot like a backward azimuth, so to speak, as to where exactly that missile came from. And hopefully we had a satellite over the area that uh, could pick it up because th that weapon system also has a big signature on a footprint on the ground. It kicks up a lot of dust, so to speak. Now, they've been hiding them. We saw pictures. They've been hiding them in built up areas. Uh, but still, nonetheless, uh, heat technology should be able to figure out where it came from. And I think that that's what's going to determine that. That will be likely the only evidence we have, because I think by the time the NTSB or anybody from the United States get there, Russia would have picked over that area and they would have gotten rid of all evidence that would have shown 
that a missile actually took down the plane. All right, stay with me for a second, Mike. I want to bring in Matt Schmidt, also a friend to the program, who's joining us over the phone right now to talk about some of the political impact this could have on the ground. He's assistant professor of national security and political science, University of New Haven, also contributor to the Matters Military blog. Um, and, Matt, you were on the ground here recently as an appointed monitor to the elections. And when we're talking about this region, it's a region you know well in Donetsk. Uh, talk a little bit about Who's running this place? Because it seems, at least to the casual observer like myself, the rebels basically run the show around here, right? Well, I think that the question, the ultimate question is, is, is where was the missile fired from and who fired it? But the available evidence points more and more strongly to the idea that it was the rebels, particularly uh, the, the tweet that was attributed to uh, Igor Strelkov, the, uh, the, the self-appointed commander in Donetsk. Um, and if that is indeed the case, and I think the real blame here lies with Vladimir Putin. Uh, it's not too strong to say that the blood is on his hands of these 295 people, including uh, the 25 or so American dead. Because even if Strelkov was the one who ordered this missile fired from, uh, say, a captured Ukrainian uh, anti-air uh, defense system, it was Vladimir Putin who put Strelkov in the middle of this mix. Hey, Vladimir Matt, Putin Matt, if you can, explain to our audience, because I think sometimes when people hear the word rebels, they think of some ragtag outfit without any coordination or direction. Talk about these rebels specifically and their connection um, to Putin or to the military hierarchy. Who are these guys and how coordinated are they um, with Russian leadership? Okay, so the first question is, is, is who are they? Um, Strelkov and most of the other active fighters in this group are former Soviet military officers. They, that means that they served in the military, they were trained by the military of the Soviet Union or the Russian Federation, dispersed, went on with various parts of their lives, and have come back together in, in any number of ways in, in this group, uh, in the Donetsk, so-called Donetsk People's Republic. The second question, how coordinated is Strelkov or, or anyone else in this group with somebody inside Russia, inside the Russian government, with Vladimir Putin or any of his commanders uh, in, the, in the Russian military, is an open question. In other words, it's hard to confirm, except that intelligence leaks have indicated over and over and over again that there is some kind of connection between Strelkov and other commanders in these rebel groups and, the, and Russian commanders. In other words, people who should have some kind of direct line chain yep. of authority from the Kremlin on down. Uh, let me bring Mike back in. It, it, the yeah. Russian press is taking pains to now identify them not as rebels but as self-defenders. Right, and they're These trying to get the distance like, you, like you'd imagine. In the sense it's, that a criminal who finds himself in a firefight with the police and ends up in a building is now suddenly defending himself in that building. That's essentially what these guys are. Hey, Mike, obviously nobody in their right mind, nobody in their right mind would ever take down a commercial jet here. Uh, to that end, what happens next? I mean, you want to talk about now uh, bringing in a whole host of other nations and think of all the flights here, commercial or let alone um, uh, other flights that are going over this area. I mean, forget about the economic impact here. Uh, globally here, what can the U.S. or should the U.S. even do? Um, what kind of pressures beyond the economic sanctions can we even put on Russia at this point? It obvious, they're obviously playing defense at the moment, trying to get away as much as possible. What's the next step that happens internationally? Yeah, well, you're right, Rich. When you shoot down a commercial airliner, you go to war against the rest of the world. And everyone, uh, all the nations that were involved in that flight, you've got uh, Dutch, other NATO countries who are, were going to be on that flight. Uh, and so what can the U.S. do now? Well, obviously, the, the, the military, the Navy is moving in, I'm sure, uh, to try to reinforce the scene. Because I, I do believe we've got to think about a conventional response, and that's to take out this capability uh, of this group, um, possibly with, uh, with the Ukraine government. Uh, let's hope this is not in result, uh, as a response, I mean, to what happened yesterday with the increase of the sanctions. Because then again, this is just a, another act of war that, that if we don't respond to, we're just going to continue uh, to have possibly these kinds of things happen again. Matt, Mike, I really appreciate a few minutes. I have a feeling this isn't the last time we're going to be talking about this, guys. Thank you so much. Um, let me bring uh, my table back in here right now. We didn't even have time to get into um, what's um, the imagery we're starting to see in Gaza with the ground invasions beginning. 
it is a very dangerous place right now, this world right now, and what our role um, is in it is a, is a legitimately debated question right now, but things are starting to move um, in ways that you can't just focus on a single incident right now. And I, it's, it's very unsettling. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to ask the question to follow up on that last interview. Who's we? Yeah. Like, who's we that's going to take out that missile battery? <laughs> I mean, uh, us, the U.S., we have no business being there. That's insanity. I mean, that's, that's between Russia and the Ukraine right now. I hate it when I agree with them. Yeah. But the, 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 let's focus on what we can do that's sensible. We can do two things. We can find out what actually happened before we call it an act right. of war. And we can make or sure. Or that for a second. Can we? Because a, as, of, yeah. as of tonight at show, apparently the scene right now is being controlled by the rebel groups. They've recovered the black box. Um, certainly the NTSB no, ain't going to be welcomed in there no to do an investigation. American military forces should be committed until I'm we not are saying certain. That. I'm saying how will we know for sure I, I, that what actually happened? I, you know I think it's a legitimate question you know that we won't be able to do the crime scene investigation. What, what I don't get is what's the motive for shooting down a commercial airliner in a, mistake, yeah. in a dispute like this that's going on in Ukraine? Malaysian, no less. Right. Did they even know what airline it was? Talk about bad luck. Malaysia. Yeah, no kidding. But I mean, that's what I don't get. In, what's, in, what's, the, it's, what's the other side? Terrorist, but then somebody <coughs> exactly. Then and I think, credit. you know, uh, and I hate to agree with you, but I think the facts are uh, certainly not, not clear. Long. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently no one here wants to agree with anybody, <laughs> but we do all agree. The second thing is to look at the question of why this airplane was in that space. The United States apparently had previously ordered American carriers to stay out of that zone. Who, in their right mind, so fair has question. Question. question? It wasn't their flight plan, though. It wasn't that they, this was accidentally in a space that it shouldn't but have been. I'm hundred percent ready. But they who's should in never charge? That those two questions. What happened? It's just about every airline around the rest of the world. I mean, American Airlines yeah, weren't but flying in that airspace, I mean, but most of the rest of the world. But who makes the decision that allows them to do that? I think don't it's forget, the it's the same airline, airline that made that U-turn. You know, going to Kuala Lumpur. I mean, that's never been. No, but they did show the amount of, to Andrew's point, they did show the amount of air traffic, not maybe on that immediate path, but in the general area right now. And to suggest that this was just some rogue flight going down there that could have been caught up uh, is, is a mistake. This is the third jet, obviously not to this scope, but two other jets, military jets, that have been shot down over this area just in the last month. I don't know what the response is, but there has to be a response. And then... Uh, we'll be talking tomorrow with Congressman Elliot Engel about this, but Israel and the unfolding situation right now, do we just watch? I, I guess we do. Uh, I guess there is another alternative, but that also has the potential to go far beyond the Gaza Strip in terms of impact. Uh, we're starting to learn how big, how small the world can be in terms yes. of impact, but also how big it is in terms of that we can't be everywhere we, at the same we, time. The United States experienced two of the most uh, extraordinary blunders when it committed military force in Iraq and Afghanistan without the truth being told and without facts being known. Bad generals fight the last war, although I, I think we all share the notion that it's no time to commit American force. It's time to discuss when that, uh, then that occurs and what information you actually need that okay. justifies it. I want to get to, because we've got the best table going, to talk about issues both facing New York and especially with Lower Hudson Valley. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about the Tappan Zee Bridge, uh, the construction project, getting a boost, but it doesn't come without questions. We'll be right back. <laughs>